Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Tristan Cabello and I am the Associate Director for the Master of Liberal Arts, the MLA uh, at John Hopkins University. Tonight is our fourth event of our MLA speaker series, which will last all four semesters. In this series, we will showcase the diversity of courses that our students can take in the program and the research that our faculty is doing. As you know, the Master of Liberal Arts is an interdisciplinary program. You can therefore take different courses in different disciplines, such as music, literature, gender studies, and sociology. And you can also take courses in history with one of our historians on the faculty, Dr. Mary Fogel. Dr. Mary Fogel has taught at uh, American University and at Mount St. Mary's University until recently, uh, was a history professor at Montgomery College, where she also directed the highly successful Montgomery Scholars Interdisciplinary Harness Program. In 2003, she received the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching Meriden Professor of the Year Award. And she's also presented for the Smithsonian and the Johns Hopkins University Odyssey program, as well as leading several study trips uh, to Cambridge University, to Ireland, and to her native Scotland. Uh, Dr. Fergal will give a 30, 35 minute presentation and we will have a few minutes at the end of the program for questions. You can actually start asking your questions in uh, the chat box in Zoom. Uh, Mary, thank you very much for coming tonight, for joining us tonight and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tristan. Let me just share my screen with everyone and um, begin. Thank you for joining us. Um, it is wonderful to be here this evening discussing poverty and compassion, um, specifically in relation to industrialization. But actually, poverty um, and the emotion of compassion really infuse a lot of my teaching interests and the, and the subjects that I pursue and teach in the MLA program. So in a way, it's kind of fitting for that too. Our focus is tonight is Scotland. Um, obviously a country dear to my heart. Um, it um, features in a pivotal sense in 19th century British history, um, dating back to 1707 in the 18th century when it officially became a part of, um, of Britain, of the UK. It um, joined England and became, it dissolved its parliament, it willingly dissolved its parliament, walked out and then united in the, in an act of union with England. Now, um, of course, that's caused many, many issues then and since. Um, Rabbi Burns, the famous Scottish poet, said that they were, had sold the nation out, um, that they'd taken English gold in order to, um, and had dissolved the country in the process. But in actual fact, Scotland maintained an awful lot of its own cultural institutions, the church, education system, the law, the legal system as well. And um, its sense of identity was strong then, and as you probably know, has, is growing now. But the, the moment that we join the story is mid 18th century, um, when a, an, a series of changes occurs. Now, what I want to, where I'll be looking at, are uh, going to be, sorry, go back again. Um, for some reason, there we go, is going to concentrate on Glasgow, on the west coast of Scotland, and Edinburgh, on the east coast, and I want you just to remember St Andrews over there in Fife, which is actually the area of Scotland that I'm from, um, and it will figure prominently in the story this evening. So what's going to happen is that by the 19th century, you're going to see the population of Scotland is going to rise significantly, as in many parts of uh, Northern Europe at the time, with the significant exception of Ireland. Uh, so you see 1801, 1.6 million by 2000, by 1901 is 4.4 million. The rate of increase has signif significantly eased off after that. This, the, this population shift um, in a way is a result of seismic changes going on underneath and they really focus on the west coast of Scotland. 
Glasgow in the middle of the 18th century, which is where our story is going to centre on this evening, was really just a sleepy port. This is a, an illustration of it in the 18th century. Um, the, what's going to happen is a series of clearances from northern Scotland will send people down into the Glasgow region and across to the, the Atlantic. They will, some of them in the 19th century will go to Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, um, and also some Irish will come over, about 300,000 Irish will move to Scotland in the 19th century. The, in the 18th century, the growth of Glasgow was heavily um, dependent on the tobacco trade. Now, in contrast, in the eastern part of Scotland, Edinburgh, uh, it is not going to industrialise to any degree the same way as the West. It had been the seat of the parliament when Scotland had been independent. And it, after the Act of Union, it concentrates almost exclusively on banking, on finance, on law, on its um, medical school, which was one of the finest in Europe at, in, during that period, during the 19th century. It's only 46 miles east of Glasgow, um, but it is like a different country. It prided itself and called itself the Athens of the North um, in the late 18th century. It was the home of people like David Hume, um, it was the home of philosophy, of ideas, and as I said, of finance. Um, when you contrast the two cities, you will see what I'm talking about. Its population will grow, um, just like Glasgow. 1755, however, actually it was more than Glasgow. But as you can see, as you go through the 19th century, it will slow down considerably. I mean, it's still growing, but nothing like at the rate that Glasgow does. Indeed, by 1901, one fifth of the population of Scotland lived in the city of Glasgow. Now it did grow from that sleepy port, its acreage grew, as you can see there, the data from 5,000 to 12 and a half thousand acres. Um, its density, however, increased, even with the increase of acreage, it didn't mean there was more room. 15 persons per acre in 1801, 94 by 1901. So what was going on? Well, the real center of this story, um, in the sense of the wealth that triggered the Industrial Revolution in Glasgow, was the tobacco trade. It, the Scottish merchants get a foothold in Virginia in particular, as I'm sure um, you all know, and they become known actually as the tobacco lords of Glasgow. The money that comes in from that tobacco trade will fund and spin off into other directions, into other industries, as you can see here, cotton, shipbuilding, coal, iron, and into a chemical industry as well, um, the art of dyeing, because textiles were so prominent. This, however, brings us to Scotland and the slave trade. Now, when I was growing up in Scotland, in schools, we were always taught that um, unlike English merchants, Scottish merchants never got involved in the slave trade because they were Presbyterian. An interesting logical deduction on, on the part of um, the sort of the, the status quo of historical knowledge at the time. Now, of course, we've since found out that, of course, is not true at all. It is an interesting phenomenon. Um, Tom Devine has done a lot of work on this, and he figured out that Scotland proportionally had actually more merchants involved, not just in the slave trade, but in owning slaves, um, especially in the Caribbean. Interestingly, though, it also had a higher proportion compared to England of Scots um, to its population involved in the abolition movement as well. So an interesting um, contrast there within the country itself, which merits a whole other lecture, a whole other night, a whole other um, engaged discussion. Um, so the, the imports of this slave labor, um, they bring in sugar, tobacco, cotton, and I just give you just the tobacco data, just to give you some idea, 2.5 million pounds of tobacco coming into Glasgow in 1715. By 1771, it's 47 million pounds, which was half of the total British tobacco imports. So you can see why this tiny sleepy port quickly began to have engineering work done, being broadened, being deepened, and became a thriving, thriving port. Um, my reference to it used to be being taught that Scotland was above the slave trade, was not involved. 
um, is captured in this, um, I don't know if you can see this poster here, it was nay us, um, which the Boland Scots said, no, we had nothing to do with it. But unfortunately, as I said, the grim reality is the, the wealth of Glasgow was very firmly founded in the transatlantic, both slave trade and in the owning, owning of plantations of slavery. But that contrast I mentioned before of also being involved in abolition, not that one um, excuses or condones the other by any manner means, does mean that Glasgow became a very interesting place. Um, Frederick Douglass spoke there in his tour of Britain, the abolitionist tour that he did before the big conference in the 1830s. And Dr. James McCoon Smith from New York um, became the first uh, uh, African-American, oh, what later we would call African-American to become a medical doctor in, 19, in 1837, graduating from Glasgow University. Um, the result of this massive wealth and industrialization is going to be a study in contrast, not just between Glasgow and Edinburgh, but within Glasgow itself. The more um, built up the inner city became, the more the middle classes and wealthier lower upper classes moved out. And so you have the grandeur of 18th century, of, of 19th century, beg your pardon, townhouses and the slums, which by the 1880s, as you know, we begin to have a photographic record. And some of the photographs are really um, very sobering. Overcrowding, disease, pollution, dirt. I mentioned earlier 300,000 Irish immigrants. There were people coming down from the Highlands who spoke Gaelic. They did not speak English, many of them. And by 1886, you can see that kind of startling statistic. A third of all families in Glasgow were living in one room, 12 foot by 10 feet. Um, into this mix comes my main um, person that I'm looking at tonight, uh, someone where um, all those of you have done graduate studies know that you end up with studying someone whom you kind of admire and, and also are a bit, um, um, hate is too strong a word, but you, but you end up really being um, dismayed at some of the, um, their words, some of how, their opinions. And Thomas Jammers definitely is such a person for me. He's going to become pivotal in Scotland, in Britain, will have an impact on northern continent of Europe, and also on the United States. Born in 1780 in Anstruther, which is near St Andrews. Um, he was born in a sleepy, relatively sleepy fishing village, but his father was a, a small merchant. He was the sixth of 14 children, and um, he went to St. Andrews University at a very young age. He also studied under Dougald Stewart at Edinburgh University. He was very much into philosophy, and he, his, his bio, very potted bio here, um, indicates something of the times, that he was very much imbued with enlightenment thought, enlightenment reading. He read Smith, he read Hume, he read Malthus. Um, he was very much taken with Hume's uh, notion that inside of us humans, we have passions that can um, be sort of regulated, that they are, and there are natural systems of compassion, there are natural systems of sympathy, is the big word that David Hume always used. Um, he had a very staid um, approach to religion. He actually becomes a minister, but really only spent about two days a week doing ministry work. Um, he was in a very sleepy little rural parish in Dalmeny in Fife. Spent most of his time playing golf in St Andrews, already the stereotype of that. Um, but round about um, 1810, he has, he has an illness that puts him out of commission for about six months. Several of his family are ill and there are some deaths in the family and he has a conversion experience. Now this becomes a profound moment as it would in anyone's life um, but with him in particular he felt this tug, this calling that God was calling him to Glasgow to an area where people he was hearing were increasingly being unchurched. That was a, a, an expression they often use that they were not experiencing the message, the gospel. And he moves to Glasgow in 1815. And in fact, if we were all suddenly transported back to Glasgow tonight, um, to 80, around about 1819, 20, and we're in the center in the Tron area of Glasgow, 
we would see masses of people. Um, this is a Wednesday. Um, it would be about one noon in the afternoon. And there would be masses of people moving towards the Torn Church to hear Thomas Chalmers speak. He was an enigmatic preacher, um, charismatic. Uh, people would be packed in, bankers would leave their banking houses, financiers, merchants, to hear the great man speak. Um, and his parish in Glasgow, he, he felt inhibited because so many people in his parish did not go to church. Now, this was largely because people already were working 60-hour weeks. Occasionally, they got, I mean, often they got some time off on a Sunday, the last thing many people were doing was going to church and because of the anonymity of the city, they weren't being pointed at. Lots of people were not going to church. And this bothered Chalmers enormously from his evangelical stance that he was beginning to adopt. Um, he thinks that at the heart of the problem is the way the church is coping and or not coping with poverty. And I'll fill you in on that in a few minutes. In fact, he's so intent on trying to solve that problem, he persuades the town council to create a new parish in the heart of the city called St. John's, and he does an experiment in the parish. Um, it lasts from 1819. Well, actually the, the experiment lasts after he leaves, but he will leave in 1823. Um, the population of the parish was about 10,500, the largest single job were weavers. And um, those weavers, in fact, I think I may have missed a slide. Uh, yeah, or rather uh, missed a point I should have made earlier, I beg your pardon. Because one of the issues with um, industrialization and mechanization was that gradually each stage of a craft became mechanized. But as it became mechanized, it usually meant that the craft workers, you never, you didn't need as many of them anymore. And so they were thrown out of work. And you can see this here in the wages of the average weekly wages of weavers. Now, when um, spinning had been mechanized, but weaving hadn't yet been mechanized, weavers could earn a great deal of money, as you can see, um, a pound a week, which was a lot then. By 1826 to 1830, they were earning a third of that because weaving had begun to be, um, steam had begun to be applied to weaving machines and the handloom weavers were being thrown out of work. And this is why indeed Andrew Carnegie's family, his father was a weaver, moved to the United States. The dislocation, which I think is the best word to use here, of employment happened to everything, whether it was dressmaking, textiles, dyeing, sheep um, carding wool, gradually each stage of each craft became mechanized. And with each um, iteration of that, there was this dislocation and this unemployment. Added to that was with this new industrial economy, there were booms and slumps on, on a scale that had never been seen before as the industrial economy of Britain, which was the first industrialized, as you know, began to um, suffer the sort of the, what we now take as for granted, the variations in, in supply and demand and having to keep up with that. Yes, they were doing a very good job of amassing a massive amount of money and colonies, but at the same time, it didn't protect them from, you know, booms and slumps happening every few years. And so you have this situation where you have a precarious workforce. So sorry, I, I, I missed that point. Um, so in Glasgow, in the St. John's Parish, where Chalmers was, he was frustrated because you see in Scotland, as was the case to some degree in England, but it was a greater degree in Scotland, poverty, when it did exist, was the a responsibility of the Kirk, of the Church of Scotland, the, the, what, the established church. And the official relief system through the church was meant for what was called the deserving poor. Now, by deserving, they meant you were poor through no fault of your own. And in those categories, they put old, orphan, sick, and lame. They usually added widows as well. Um, each response, parish was responsible for its own paupers, and a pauper was someone who officially received 
poor relief from the Kirk session from the parish. There was no official relief system for the able-bodied poor, who were often also called undeserving, because if you're able-bodied, you should be working. Now, during the more rural times, the, if there were famines, there were usually exceptions made for uh, you know, exigent circumstances, for emergency circumstances. But for what the heart of what I'm talking about tonight is booms and slumps and dislocations of employment, of gradual mechanization of employment and throwing out people, craft workers out of work, were not considered as part of uh, a natural disaster. And because that was not accepted, then it meant that there was massive problems with poor relief and with unemployment specifically. How could you relieve the industrial, unemployed, able-bodied poor, became the question, without increasing pauperism, official poor relief handed out by the parish? Chalmers said, you don't. One of the basic premises of that, a theme of many 19th century Victorian um, ministers was, um, a theme of their sermons was, the poor you shall always have with you. They used that quote from the gospel. Um, but Chalmers went even one step further. He thought you could almost eliminate any dependence on parish poor relief in the cities. He said that taxation was an artificial solution for poverty. As I said, he, did, he personally, there were a few who did, but he was one of the mainstream, didn't accept that becoming unemployed due to these booms and slumps and dislocation was a reason to receive rel relief. He said instead, and this is where he drew from Hume, uh, there was a natural solution. Personal behavior, you should encourage people to be upright, to only spend on what they can afford, um, to be thrifty, nothing all very straightforward. Um, he then went further and said, and also you should encourage them to seek out any and all relatives, find as many relatives across the globe as they have and ask them to give them support before they ever would ask or approach the parish. He said, then you could, then you could ask the philanthropic who would be sympathetic to their plight on condition that they would get work and not become official paupers. And then the poor themselves should help one another. So this was his solution, and this was the experiment that he set out to have in St. John's Parish. He resurrected, he, Church of Scotland is Calvinist, and he resurrected John Calvin's Institutes of Christian Relig Religion as regards how to organize the church. And he brought back a specific office, the deacon, whose office was to look after social welfare, usually of widows and orphans in the time of Calvin. But Chalmers expanded it to the, the, to the city itself. And this is where he is fascinating because in many ways, a lot of what he said in relation to breaking cities down into smaller local units, a lot of that does make sense. He actually thought you could bring rural society into the darkness, as he said, of the city. He implemented a visitation system using the elders of the church, the deacons, uh, Sunday school teachers, and he even brought in female visitors because he just didn't have enough people. There were so many poor, he didn't have enough people. So he even encouraged the wives and daughters of middle class, his middle class parishioners, the wealthy, um, to visit and help with this exercise. He rather chillingly called, them, called this group a moral police. They were to make sure that every corner of potential income was searched before any, the parish would give anyone who was poor any money. And then he announced, um, suddenly, surprisingly, the applications for poor relief began to decline. Now, if you read the questions that his visitors, his moral police asked of the poor when they visited, your heart would stop a little bit, I think. They are incredibly probing, they're incredibly inquisitorial. They are incredibly, un they seem unfeeling in relation to exhausting every single part 
of um, potential aid. And when you consider the conditions that many of these individuals were living in, you do wonder we have no record of what they thought about these visitors. Um, but you do wonder, and I'm personally not surprised they stopped applying for relief. He always claimed it worked, though, because the, the, the number of applications declined. But I think it is telling that after four years of this experiment, he left, returned to academia, and took up the chair of moral philosophy at St Andrews, and then um, divinity at Edinburgh. And, but his ideas, he wrote extensively about this. He published, he was a vociferous publisher. As I said, he was a great reputation as being a great sermonizer. And um, he went to London, he talked there. He wrote letters across to the continent, especially into parts of Prussia, into France. And his ideas had a significant impact on the theories and practice of poor relief, indeed for the remainder of the 19th century, and I would argue up to today. To take the positive first, I think as I said earlier, that his locality principle makes a lot of sense. And indeed is in many ways, many have reverted to that, many urban reformers have tried to bring to encourage community within the inner city. That emphasis on community and on um, the ability to, be, to know one another, not to be anonymous was huge. And he helped to, to, um, to formalize that. Um, his encouraging of women to be involved in this um, moral police actually spun out into an acceptance that middle-class women, granted, never working-class women, uh, middle-class women should in fact, and should be visible um, in the philanthropic sphere in the city. It, they were used to being Lady Bountiful and acting as such um, a sort of Downton Abbey type or um, Jane Austen Emma type giving out charity in the countryside. But he said, no, there's a role for them in the city too. And the notion of women as teachers, Sunday school teachers, as being part of what would later become the settlement movement, settlement houses, Jane Adams, for example, um, in Hull House in Chicago. Uh, this idea spreads across Britain and in other parts of the globe. Indeed, there was a charity organization set up with Octavia Hill that some of you may be familiar with, and again, spread to New York, Seattle, Washington, London, and becomes part of the settlement houses um, of the end of the 19th century. And in all of, the, I'm just gonna check my time, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm coming up to it. So this is working out though. His impact abroad on the language um, of poverty was also um, very, very apparent. You see, as taking up those positions, teaching moral philosophy, then teaching divinity, especially in Edinburgh, his records, the, the, the Chalmers archives, which are held in New College in Edinburgh, they are full of letters to American businessmen who are sending their sons across either to get a, a, a regular degree or a divinity degree indeed. And when they came, especially in his moral philosophy class, he taught a great deal about this notion of sympathy and this notion that uh, really the unemployed, the able-bodied should not be given official relief, that um, other, they would become indolent and lazy and dissolute, his words, not mine. Um, some US philanthropists like um, James Lennox here, John Griscom, I'm sorry, this is Lewis Tappan, um, James Lennox and John, John Griscom um, were very friendly with Chalmers and wrote back and forth many, many times. This is, it's quite fascinating, the literature, the letters that are in New College. Societies for the Prevention of Pauperism um, began to emerge almost immediately in the, in the 1820s as Chalmers wrote about this formalizing of his notion of what to do with cities and to what to do with poverty in cities. Um, they emerged in New York, in Baltimore, Boston, Philadelphia, Albany. Um, and the vocabulary, which is really kind of the, my culminating point tonight, of deserving, undeserving, lazy and indolent, um, 
can be summed up in this, can be seen in this um, quote from one of these uh, societies for the prevention of pauperism. The effectual way to make poor people is to provide for poor people. I'm not saying there is no um, application of that, but when you apply it to people who, as I said, are in the situation of being dislocated from craft and having to find another skill, usually having to go in at the lowest level then of a mechanized skill, um, then the lack of compassion uh, is the result in many, in many cases, especially in the 19th century. But the vocabulary has continued into the 20th century. Interestingly, especially in the United States. Um, but again, that's another talk, another time. And so I end with a comparison with the, the Glasgow picture at the beginning, Baltimore, um, this is in the early 18th century, will also become, as you know, a bustling port, a bustling city. And its Society for the Prevention of Pauperism will actually do an awful lot of work in the city um, to prevent, to spread Chandler's ideas. Um, my problem with that is what I mentioned near the beginning. When, when slumps and booms and dislocation are not considered like famines, in other words, so no one's the, the workers, it's not their fault, then this vocabulary of pauperism, of indolence, of laziness becomes very difficult to remove and it becomes synonymous with being poor. Thank you very much. Mary, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating presentation. Maybe we, you can stop uh, sharing your screen. Yes, I'm going to try to find it. But oh, that's totally OK. <laughs> um, and uh, so I know, Mary, that you teach a, uh, a, a one of our core courses here in the MLA program, which is What's History, that I also teach sometimes. And one of the questions that I ask you know, right away at the beginning of the course to the students is, um, why do we study history? And uh, the common answer that I usually get is because history repeats itself. And so we study history because we don't want history to repeat itself. And so here, what's beautiful in this presentation, of course, is that we can see that some of the discourses on poverty are indeed transhistorical. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it seems that the same vocabulary is being used um, uh, for the past two centuries here. Uh, one question for you, uh, Mary, is, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about, uh, because we have um, a lot of students who are doing their own research in the MLA program, their students who are doing their own historical research, um, can you talk more about your methodology here? Uh, what type of sources did you access? Did you go to the archives? Are those sources all published? Um, uh, what are what, What's your methodology? Okay, so now I have to admit, of course, my age, I really wish I'd been a, a graduate student during the age of the internet, <laughs> that would have been so much better. But, um, but on the other hand, it was so much fun. I went to the National Archives of Scotland, I actually did some work in Boston as well, in the public library there on the Tappan Brothers. Um, I, the, the new college in Edinburgh, which is on top of the mound near the castle, if anyone's yeah. been to Edinburgh, has Chammer's whole collection. And yeah. it's, uh, it's a minefield, the grant is wonderful. <laughs> Parliamentary papers. My most interesting uh, field trip to look at a, a, a source, I'll try to make this quick, but it was, I, I was, for some reason, there were an awful lot of fires in 19th century churches and a lot of records disappeared, but the ones that did survive, the Church of Scotland tried to centralize in the 20th century. But there was one parish I could never find its records and I was convinced that there had not been a fire and they still existed. So I wrote to them and this man wrote back and said, oh yes, I do have them, but don't tell them. And so I wrote back, not even phone calls, yeah, wrote, yeah. Said, can I see them? He said, yes, if you meet me at Glasgow Station wearing yeah. a red carnation. And at this point I thought, <laughs> my mum would tell me not to go, but I'm so desperate to see these records. Anyway, I went, I survived. Um, I've never read records so quickly in all my life. Um, and they were fascinating and were very important. So all over the place really was my um, research. Yeah, and, and as I always say to um, uh, uh, the historians that I teach in, uh, in the program, um, uh, you know, there's nothing that beats um, 
uh, archival research, yes. going through boxes, <laughs> going through uh, microfilms and microfiches, yes. uh, because uh, it's true that uh, the new generation of historians, you know, think probably that a lot of things have been digitized. Uh, however, mm -hmm. uh, archival records are not always digitized. Sometimes yeah. you have to go through uh, the archives. And uh, what a beautiful story. I mean, I have you know, my <laughs> own stories, you know, as historians where uh, I know people who invited me to their attic to, yes. <laughs> uh, to go through boxes of, uh, of archives. Uh, and those were the best moments for you. Those oh, were yes. the best moments when you, when you actually find something that, yeah. uh, uh, that you didn't know you would, you would, yeah. you would find. Though, though now looking back, Justin, I think we should have had a buddy system, but anyway. Yeah, that's... absolutely. <laughs> well, there were, there were no cell phones. And so, um, uh, other question for you. You mentioned uh, the fact that you have, uh, you know, this love-hate relationship with uh, Chalmers, which, uh, of course, is perfectly understandable. Uh, and as historians, also, we uh, tend to fall in love with uh, our topics, our characters, the the historical figures that we that we studied. How did you manage that to you know that distance and also the fact that sometimes you are studying probably um, a, a character that uh, whose thinking may not be in line with yours or with dominant thinking you know in place in the United States, for example. Yeah, it was actually a really good lesson in trying to find out motivation. Not that you can ever find out pure motivation for sure but um trying to see the contradictions and him actually made me more aware of the contradictions that we all have in ourselves and that um you would like sort of a pure <laughs> hero or heroine to 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 study but it, it actually helped me a great deal teaching history to be honest just because um it, it it didn't threaten me at first I felt very upset you know when I read some of his things like, moral police I mean who talks about a moral police anyway um but taking the man in all of his um warts and all um made me realize that uh, it sounds perhaps banal but it made me realize that of course that's just what we all are mm -hmm. and um, of course, some to a greater degree than others. And it actually helped me, I believe, as a historian. Um, it, did, it did take me a wee while to reconcile that. Um, but I found that the more I read about him, the more, uh, the, 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 it was the research that helped me. It was the research that did it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have many questions from the audience, Mary, and I want to try to get through mm -hmm. as many as we can. Uh, Derek is asking a question, um, probably influenced by a book that you assigned in your course by E.P. Thompson, I'm oh. thinking. Uh, do we see specific influence from Chalmers in the English agitations of the, of the 1840s uh, and the development of class consciousness in the English working class? Yes, we absolutely do, Derek. Um, this othering of the poor, um, it meant they became a subset of the working class. Mm -hmm. And because it coincided also with what Thompson was writing about, um, uh, well, Thompson doesn't directly address the whole Victorianization, the, yeah. you know, the embourgeoisement, as it were, of mm -hmm. Victorian society. But in some ways, his is a compliment to that, um, with an E, not an I, um, that this um, embourgeoisement actually reached the working classes too. And so the notion of respectability haunted working classes and actually I think it's an area that Thompson could have expanded on um, that he is so intent which of course is great to try and get to the voices um, but the, the the notion of respectability is something that's going to haunt the British working class and the, the, as a result of this vocabulary of poverty the worst thing you could do was to be seen to be taking the handout and that continues into the 20th century. So it's more, I'm not really answering that question probably as well as I should, but I would say it's more that Thompson's work complements what we know about the Victorian period and this language of class that R.S. Neal did so beautifully that begins to creep in to these categorizations of, of the poor and of the working class and the substrata of poor. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, a question from Ross here. Uh, charity is it best provided through private sources or directly from government? Uh, is one method more uh, more effective than the other? I don't know if Chalmers actually has an answer about this. Uh, um, but has Glasgow, and the second question from Ross, uh, has Glasgow caught up with Edinburgh um, in modern economy? Yes, um, to the second, the second is much easier to answer. <laughs> um, yes, it has. I mean, it has reinvented itself. It's the um, the jazz um, um, festival is, is now in Glasgow. It has um, a lot of, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the comedian Billy Connolly, but he rues the day that the big Glasgow tenements were all torn down and that community dispersed. But having said that, they were torn down and in, it's in their places, um, there wasn't a, sort of a, um, an upgrading of Glasgow centre. Um, and so it is not, however, caught up as a center of banking and finance to the same degree. Even though the money was coming into Glasgow, it was being funneled out to Edinburgh and London, which is interesting. Um, the first question, Chalmers would unequivocally have said private um, charity is definitely the best. Yeah. Definitely the best. Um, uh, a question from Carlos here, um, Mary, for you. Did Chalmers publishing coupled with this adamant belief that his experiment worked influence how it was received abroad? Or would his association with philanthropists have been more impactful in spreading it? Could you say the first part of that again? Uh, did Chalmers publishing coupled with his adamant belief that his experiment worked influence how it was received abroad? Yes, yes. yes, for sure. And um, there was another experiment, a famous one called the Hamburg experiment that actually was simultaneous and that um, also um, was intent on, on uh, it more was talking about putting Kur into a workhouse and to give relief only in the workhouse. This is, which in the end is what the English and Scottish poor relief acts of the 1830s did. Um, but with um, Chammers, he actually did fudge the data. I've, I found in the Glasgow archives, penciled in data that was authenticated by the archivist <laughs> that Chammers had hidden, but that his elders had later put in. Um, his experiment actually did fail. The number of applications okay. fell, but the amount mm -hmm. of poverty increased. But anyway, yes, the fact that he constantly claimed it did and wrote this Christian and civic economy, he became known as the expert in the field. Uh, another interesting question here. It seems that Chalmers was a Calvinist in his theories. Uh, is that uh, in that area, perhaps he was not alone in his belief and practices? Question: Was he alone? Was he was he followed by uh, a lot of other people, or was his uh, theories really um, uh, unique? Um, the way he articulated them and. Um... Uh, turned them into uh, a kind of enlightenment style encyclical on poverty and its mm -hmm. treatment. Um, the way he regularized them, the way he made them sound like, a, 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 in a way a bit like Marx, but in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. a sound like an inevitable progression if you followed his ideas, um, definitely um, was effective for sure and was um, was copied by many others. There were about... I think in the end, I found about 60 experiments in, okay. in, in Scotland alone that tried to follow his plan. They all failed, um, but it took a long time for that. The interesting thing is that the, the, the notion that um, the poor should not be helped eventually, of course, changed with the welfare state in Britain and Northern Europe, and, and not only Northern Europe, but many parts of continental Europe but not here to the same degree. So his ideas in some ways linger much longer here than elsewhere. Uh, one final question from Mary. Um, thank you for an interesting presentation, she says. Um, and the question is when people were displaced from trades and flocked to cities, uh, if they were unable to find work, how did they survive? Um, often they did not. The, the growth of, of beggars on the street, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and the growth of beggars on the street was huge in cities like Glasgow. Um, uh, they often sent their children to try and find as much, chimney sweepers. Uh, I mean, it's really hard. You saw the data on the explosion of mm -hmm. the population. So translate that into a large middle class 
and all these townhouses with multiple fireplaces, number of chimney sweeps, chambermaids. I mean, a lot of families had to send their children to work um, in order to buy time um, until they could find something that was more fitting them. That's why Andrew Carnegie's father got out of, and he was born in, the, he lived in Dunfermline. He didn't see that happening and he got out. Um, and, and, and emigration societies were huge during this time as well. Uh, and also I didn't emphasize Malthus, but there was a huge following as you all probably know for Malthus and overpopulation. Um, and so, um, to answer Mary's question, a lot of them were literally, um, you know, hand by mouth survival or, or not. The, um, the number of orphans and orphanages grew exponentially. Uh, Mary, I want to thank you for this amazing presentation and the great conversation that we had. Uh, we had many questions from the audience, but we cannot take them all uh, <laughs> today. Um, and I just want to tell the audience also, uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, we have one final event in this series, which is scheduled on uh, Wednesday the 10th, which is uh, next week at 6 p.m. with one of our philosophers this time. Um, and the presentation is entitled uh, the, Cosmo the Intimate Cosmopolitan. Uh, so please join us on uh, Wednesday the 10th at 6 p.m. Um, and uh, we hope to see you there and uh, have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.